Welcome you to Helsinki and the ninth conference of the International Network for Economic Method. It's a delight to see so many of you, of you uh, having made your way to the edge of the world. And uh, Finland, this very word, could be uh, understood. Um, and inferring from the uh, conference of the program, we are going to have an exciting three days of uh, uh, intellectual interaction. This is a, another indication of the flourishing of the field. Uh, we already had three parallel sessions and this one will now bring us together in one uh, place. I'm also seeing a number of uh, other faces here and this is because this particular session has been made open for all, that is uh, including uh, those who have not registered uh, for the conference itself. I'm, I'm recognizing familiar faces, local economists and others here. Uh, hopefully they will speak out at the, during the discussion uh, time. Um, the theme of this session could not possibly be more hot and topical, uh, the crisis in economics. Every so many years or decades, uh, the, the, uh, these claims are being made that economics is in crisis and this is one such time, unsurprisingly. It's my great privilege to introduce to you Professor Alan Kerman, our first keynote speaker. He's a highly recognized economist with many important contributions and uh, especially an open and critical mind. He's an insider uh, who might be able to tell us what, if anything, has gone wrong with economics. Insiders, as uh, we know, are supposed to know better. Uh, it's all yours. Well, thank you very much for that kind introduction, Oskar. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I would have said uh, uh, it's an honor and a pleasure, but I remember that uh, when um, General MacArthur was inspecting the troops in uh, Japan after the Second World War, the general who was receiving him said, General, uh, it's an honor and a pleasure. And uh, then uh, the, he said, these reviewed troops and MacArthur started by saying it's an honor and a pleasure and the general stood up and said no sir it's an honor and a pleasure for us and MacArthur said that's what I meant so, <laughs> <laughs> so I won't use that phrase but it's a pleasure to be here and uh, to talk about a subject which um, mysteriously although this periodically happens and throughout my career in economics we've gone through various crises and I have my bookshelves are full of books called things like The Death of Economics and uh, things like this, but uh, I notice that uh, the economics profession doesn't seem to have been greatly dented by uh, these attacks. So let me start out by saying that we've been faced with this virtual collapse of the world financial system and it's had real consequences, it's not just the financial system, and now just recently, in the last week, couple of weeks, the system's gone through another paroxysm. And when you hear the explanations that are given, what do they involve? They involve networks, networks of banks. They involve contagion, contagion, panic, and so forth at all levels. And they also involve the word trust. They say, well, trust broke down. But these are not features which you find in your standard macroeconomic models. But they are typical of what we come to call complex systems. And these sort of systems have the property that left to themselves, they can undergo major changes without something happening from the outside to cause that. And I think that's a very important um, thing to keep in mind, that you cannot rely on the idea that your system is somehow calmly sailing along and every now and then there's some big ex outside exogenous shock which knocks it off course and then you all wait until it's back on course again and that was just bad and we can all get on with our usual business. So. In other disciplines, I think there's been a shift away from that. 
Bob May, the ecologist, who was the president of the Royal Society in the UK, said that when he arrived uh, in ecology, there was this comfortable belief that if you left nature to itself, it would self-organize and would be very stable. And he, amongst others, pointed out that this is not the case, that ecological systems can go through sudden collapses which are not generated by some major uh, exogenous shock. And uh, another thing that people have long time argued is that, well, it may be true that sy these systems uh, somehow are not functioning perfectly, but they evolve towards optimality. And this is an argument which has been imported uh, from biology into economics and the other way around. So that when you look at these things, you say, well, that's optimal. We know that this particular animal has adapt adapted optimally to his uh, circumstances, and he's had millions of years to do it, in the case of ants, for example. But uh, even that notion has been challenged now in other disciplines, and the notion that the a system has evolved towards something which functions optimally is now strongly challenged, and I'll make some remarks about that. So, Given that these other disciplines believe that these highly complicated systems can go through these sort of traumas without some outside shock, then I think maybe this should cause us to fundamentally rethink our theory and indeed our standard methodology in economics. And where, where could I find a better audience than uh, this to think about methodology in economics? So here's the structure of this talk. First of all, I think it's worth talking about whether we have any responsibility as economists for the crisis. Secondly, how sound is our basic theory? Thirdly, just a few remarks about the, the theory that underlies most of our standard models, general equilibrium. Then, uh, some remarks about the efficient markets hypothesis, which underlies most of financial economics. Then I briefly mention an alternative approach. Uh, discuss very quickly two models one of fluctuating asset prices and another one in which information is contagiously actually eliminated rather than created and a couple of conclusions. Okay, now remember where we are. In, in 2003, Bob Lucas, the president of the American Economic Association said, the central problem of depression prevention has been solved. So that was good news. And in 2004, Ben Bernanke, who was chairman of the Federal Reserve Board, wrote several papers and celebrated what he called the great moderation. That is the removal or the essential disappearance of volatility in macroeconomic phenomena and time series. And indeed, he went further and he attributed that to the fact that we were better now at economic policy making. And I think we should ask two important questions. To what extent should the economic crisis cause us to rethink our economic theory? And are we, in fact, responsible for the crisis? And of course, that's an old question. Are scientists or theorists responsible for the consequences or the use to which their theories are put? And these people, you, those of you who are familiar with post-Second uh, World War history will know that these are people looking at Los Alamos at the uh, atomic bomb and Oppenheimer and others were the physicists who developed the atomic bomb. And then the question at the time was, to what extent did the physicists bear any responsibility for the use to which atomic weapons were put? And now I think we should uh, also ask the question, to what extent are economists responsible for the use to which their models are put? And I would claim that we've been making unsound models which have been used as the basis for policies and practices. Maybe those policies and practices are not those which we would have chosen, but nevertheless they're used uh, for, as the basis for them. And this is not simple, harmless academic uh, research. Too many people have developed and acted according to a worldview which was unjustified. And what are now referred to as excesses, which are used to explain why the economic system got into trouble, People say, well, this is due to excesses or uh, behavior which was not really uh, kosher um, and people were somehow trying to cheat the system. And I think that's not true. These excesses are an intrinsic part of the system. The system evolves in a way in which people develop rules and then learn to get round rules and gradually the whole system will evolve in a way which can cause its own collapse. I think we weren't guilty of not forecasting 
the onset of the crisis, but we were guilty of building models in which these sort of crises can't even happen. Now, I think a sign of a real crisis in a, a theory is when you find that the people who use it start to get upset and start to criticize it. And here I have a long co quote from Governor Trichet, the governor of the European Central Bank. And those people who don't know may like to know that tricher means to cheat in French. <laughs> and uh, one of his uh, advisors was called l'arnaque, um, which means the sting. So uh, I used to think Trichet and uh, l'arnaque together were a wonderful couple. But nevertheless, what Trichet says here, he says basically macro model, uh, I won't read you the whole thing, macro models failed to predict the crisis, seemed incapable of explaining what was happening to the economy in a convincing manner. As a policymaker during the crisis, I found the available models of limited help. In fact, I would go further, in the face of the crisis, we felt abandoned by conventional tools. In the absence of clear guidance from existing analytical frameworks, policymakers had to place particular reliance on our experience and judgment and experience inevitably played a key role. In other words, we somehow dropped theory. When faced with a real crisis, we gave up on theory and went for seat of the pants <coughs> navigation. Paul de Grau had a nice observation in financial uh, times where he said clearly the financial crisis is not only due to the delusions of macroeconomists, the delusions are quite widespread amongst bankers, supervisors, medias and media and policy makers. Yet society expects the community of scientists to be less prone to delusions than the rest. And in that sense, the responsibility of the economics profession is crushing. But much more important, I think, is this quote from Lord Adair Turner, who's the head of the UK Financial Services Authority, is responsible for the whole of the financial sector in the UK. And I think he really hits the nail on the head. He says, but there is also a strong belief, which I share, that bad or rather oversimplistic, overconfident economics helped create the crisis. There was a dominant conventional wisdom that markets were always rational and self-equilibrating, that market completion by itself could ensure economic efficiency and stability, and that financial innovation and increased trading activity were therefore axiomatically beneficial. And I think that's exactly the point, that not that we somehow, as economists, uh, manipulated things wrongly or so forth, but rather that we conveyed this impression that we really understood what was going on and that therefore everybody could be reasonably happy. So where does this all start from? And I think the observation is that if you ask any well-trained economist, he would tell you an economic model is not scientific if it does not have sound micro foundations. In other words, it must be based on the rational, optimizing behavior of the individuals in the market or an economy. And of course, that's been, as everybody here knows, has been widely criticized uh, long before Herb Simon, in fact. Uh, uh, Pareto, who is often regarded as the father of modern mathematical economics, said uh, in, a, in his later work, when he became a sociologist, he said, I consider that people basically spend some of their time making non-rational decisions and the rest of their time rationalizing those decisions. <laughs> and in a sense, you can see that uh, the idea that we have all these people who are be behaving calmly and rationally is probably very far from the truth. And what is worse is not only do we assume that the individuals in the economy are behaving like that, but we assume that we can represent what's going on at the aggregate level as if it were the behavior of one of those individuals. And I'd say this is at the heart of the general equilibrium model. Um, but can you just aggregate all these individuals into one individual? Well, we know that when you try to aggregate, you lose a lot of structure. And it may not be the case that the aggregate behaves like an individual. And secondly, you also know that you can add structure. That is, people who seem, when you look at them individually, to be behaving rather strangely, when you aggregate them out, something uh, consistent emerges out of their behavior. So in neither sense can you assimilate the behavior of the aggregate to the behavior of a representative individual. And that was always referred to as the scientific approach. And I like this quote from Mark Twain, who said, there's something fascinating about science. One gets such wholesale returns of conjecture out of such a trifling investment of fact. And I think that's one of the defects of our 
profession has been that we've focused a great deal on our models and on well-known sets of data, but we have ceased in some sense to observe the facts and the underlying behavior of people. So, why, do we, why are we so attached to these rational individuals? Well, I think the argument really is that it was for mathematical convenience and not for economic plausibility. And many economists from Pareto, Cookman, many great economists have argued that in fact our assumptions on people's preferences are based on the introspection of economists and not on careful observation of people's behavior. For example, we don't allow for the development of preferences over time. We don't allow for the fact that people change their preferences as they learn what they like. We don't allow for the fact that other people influence your preferences. And anybody who has a teenage child will know that he doesn't have his own preferences. He has the preferences of the guys in his class. And if he wants to, if they're all wearing t-shirts which are Quicksilver, he will come home in a t-shirt which is Quicksilver. And that's not because when he was born he had preferences for those t-shirts. <coughs> so what's the easy way out? As I said, the easy way out is to make the assumption, not to actually deduce this, but to make the assumption that the aggregate behaves like an individual. And so they use the representative individual. And we know from the underlying results in general equilibrium theory that if you have many individuals, you cannot do that in general. So this is a, a, a way of avoiding the basic results proved in the 70s, which showed that you cannot normally aggregate the, ag uh, the individuals up in this way. It's not legitimate. So, most people would like to know, how did the economy suddenly get into a downturn like the current crisis? And the question is, have we done something about that? Are we now building models which can explain this sort of crisis? And, or do we simply offer ad hoc explanations and carry on with building the same models? The most famous model is the dynamic stochastic general equilibrium model. And in my view, we start with the wrong basis. We start with the isolated individual, and then we build out to the aggregate and this ignores the fact that individuals are constantly interacting with each other at a local level. They're not simply only looking at the market prices. And therefore, to use a standard phrase, uh, we should view the economy as a complex adaptive system. Now, you may say, well, these sort of complaints, we've heard these before. And indeed, we have. And I had correspondence with Bob Solo, who many of you here will be familiar with, the Nobel Prize winner from many years ago now, and this was in 1988. This is a long time ago. And he said, my view of the way economists actually do behave coincides with yours, most especially about macroeconomists. I've become a sort of common scold on this subject. I wholeheartedly agree with the point that economics self-destructs in part because we insist on supposing that everywhere and always individuals maximize purely individualistic preferences subject only to technological, legal, and budget constraints. It is a transparently false assumption, and the brotherhood, by which he means the economic uh, profession, expends vast ingenuity trying to account for facts within that silly framework. There are at least two of us, he said. Now, that was in 1988. I'm not sure there are many more now. <laughs> so what's happened? Uh, we kept on insisting on these scientific foundations. We avoided the problems of aggregation and said, well, we're just going to assume that the aggregate behaves like an individual. And we've carried on building more and more mathematically sophisticated models. And that's become a criteria for judging them. Not how good are they at explaining economic phenomena, but how sophisticated are they, and do, have you moved on from the last model? And these models have the basic problem that they don't contain the possibility of a crisis. And in my view, at least, they bear no perceptible relation to reality. And you might just like to notice that some 21 years after the original letter, Bob Solo was asked what he thought about the current situation, and he said, maybe there is in human nature a deep-seated, perverse pleasure in adopting and defending a wholly counterintuitive <laughs> doctrine that leaves the uninitiated, an uninitiated peasant wondering what planet he or she is on. And I think that's exactly how many people feel, and not only the uninitiated peasants. So let's get back to our uh, person who's now become one of my heroes, Trichy. And he says, I think we have to think about how to characterize the homo economicus at the heart of any model. The atomistic optimizing, optimizing agents underlying existing models 
Do not capture behavior during a crisis period. We need to deal better with heterogeneity across agents, the interaction among those agents. We need to entertain alternative mot motivations for economic choices. Behavioral economics, he mentions, agent-based modeling. Such approaches, says the governor of the Bank, Central Bank, European Central Bank, are worthy of our attention. So I think we should pay some attention to them. And as Ben Bernanke said, one of the underlying hypotheses of most modern macroeconomic models is that people have rational expectations. That is, they foresee correctly. Even though the future is uncertain, they know what that uncertainty is and have a correct picture of it. And Ben Bernanke now says, I just think it's not realistic to think that human beings can fully anticipate all possible interactions and complex developments. The best approach for dealing with this uncertainty is to make sure that the system is fundamentally resilient and that we have as many fail-safes and backup arrangements as possible. In other words, he's coming to admit now that the system is intrinsic, but not intrinsically stable. That we have actually to do something to try and keep it on a stable path. And that's very important because there is this, in part, ideological belief that we should leave markets alone and the less we interfere with them, the better they will work. So now the question is, the other explanation is, ah, but it's not the models, it's not the, I think it's all these nasty people, they're always mean and uh, illegal people who are doing things which undermine the system. And, but if you look around in the, the sort of crisis that we've had, you cannot believe that there are any individuals who are really responsible for it. As Voltaire says, in an avalanche, no single snowflake feels itself responsible. And as I, Isaac Newton said, I can calculate the motion of heaven, heavenly bodies, but not the madness of people. So this is a collective phenomenon. It's not due to being able to identify a few Madoffs and other people. So what about our assumptions on individuals? Now, one of the things that we know is that if we have agents who are different from each other, and typically macroeconomists assume that there's one agent, so they can't be different from each other, then, in fact, we can actually weaken the assumptions that we make about people's preferences and choices. And what looks at the aggregate behavior, behavior, like the behavior of a very sophisticated agent, once you have more of these agents who are different, then you can generate that behavior without having to rely on the person being so sophisticated. Now, here is an example, which I hope will work, may work, may not work. Let's see. This is... Uh, uh, people who behave by very simple rules. Ah, I'm sorry, but you can see them. These are bees, okay? And you can't hear them. Unfortunately, I turned off the sound. But uh, somebody who's clever might, might better turn the sound back on again for me. Uh, we, but we have to... Wait a minute, we have to go into system preferences. Because I cancelled the sound. Because people in the airplane shout at me. There we go. Sound, get rid of mute. I, I will show you this again. The, the sound is important. That's the only reason I have to. Um, I want you to see this example because here are people who are very simple. And I think it was this one. Now, what are these people doing? Well, they're bees. And bees have to keep their hive at a constant temperature. And the way you do that is to fan air through the hive. Now you might say to yourself, well, how do they achieve that? And any good macroeconomist would say, well, let me take the representative bee and I'll tell you what happens. When the temperature goes up, he beats his wings faster and faster. So what you will hear as the temperature goes up, or should hear, would be as the temperature went up. But you don't hear that. It's always exactly the so same level of sound. How can that possibly be? Well, it's because these individuals all have different thresholds of temperature. So if you have a very low threshold, when the temperature gets to that, you start fanning the air through the hive. But when the temperature rises, more bees uh, join in. But they all beat their wings at the same speed. They don't vary them. They're very simple. They're on or off. And as the temperature rises, more bees join in. And the point about this little example is that these people are extremely simple individually, but collectively they have a very beautiful continuous response to changes in the environment. 
So the idea here is to show that what you can have is a, a group of individuals who are very simple, but collectively they produce rather sophisticated behavior. And they, in fact, one of the mysteries um, is how does the hive manage to reproduce this nice distribution of threshold temperatures that you have? And uh, how does it just have the right proportion of bees that join in at the right temperatures? And it turns out that it's more complicated than that. You actually, they actually learn at what speed they have to beat their wings, you know, what temperature they have to join in. And they learn from each other. And somehow they organize themselves collectively, even though they're extremely simple, into this rather sophisticated uh, situation. Ooh, am I back again? OK, so what you see there is coordination of very simple individuals who generate a very nice reaction. It's nothing to do with these individuals being clever, having rational expectations, whatever. They're just beating their wings, you know. And I think one of our problems is that this uh, response, of course, is referred to as a very efficient response to the um, environment. In fact, even that is actually not really correct. These guys are not that efficient. As somebody once said, uh, Deborah Gordon, a famous entomologist, she said, you know, if you think that ants have evolved in a way that makes them all behave in the optimal way and respond to their environment, just spend a few summers watching them. Just look at them, and you'd be amazed at how inefficient many of them are. And same with the bees. If you look carefully at those little movies, there are odd bees who are just wandering around who haven't quite sort of understood what's going on. But in general, they get it right. Okay? So it's not that they're really efficient. And I think economists have become much too preoccupied with, uh, obsessed with the notion of efficiency rather than the problem of coordination. Coordination is a central problem in economics, for me at least, uh, rather than efficiency. And I'm, if I'm allowed, if Pascal will, uh, if will allow me to tell uh, a quick story uh, just to illustrate how obsessed economists are with efficiency. There were three people playing golf. There was a priest, a psychoanalyst, and an economist. And they were playing golf on Sunday afternoon, and the guy in front was playing extremely slowly, very slowly. And he had a caddy to help him. The guy was there. And these three people behind started to get very upset because it was their Sunday afternoon and they were wasting it. And they said, can we play through? Come on, speed up a bit. And still, the guy still played very slowly. So finally, they designated the priest to go and ask what was happening. So he went up there and he came back white. He was really upset. And he said, you know why this poor person plays so slowly? It's because he's blind. He said, and I feel so bad. Here I am every Sunday telling people to be nice to other people, and I'm shouting at this poor guy who's blind playing golf. And he turns to the psycho psychoanalyst and he said, Joe, what do you think about this situation? And Joe says, well, this is terrible. I have all these people on the, on the couch, you know, and I'm telling them how to live with their problems, and here am I screaming at this guy. This is really bad. So they turn to the economist and they say, Fred, what do you think? And Fred says, I think this situation is totally inefficient. This person should play at night. And you see, economists have a different vision of the way the world works. Anyway, so what I'm saying is that I think that one of the interesting problems for us is how these collective phenomena arise from the interaction between individuals. So, in the face, as I said, of these repeated and infrequent crises, I think we should really rethink our models and try and work out what's going on within these systems which causes them to have these sudden and unanticipated shocks. And Ben Bernanke again, who's becoming, as you can see, like Trichet, one of my heroes, and what is interesting is that central bankers are really preoccupied with this problem, whereas the economics profession doesn't seem to be so concerned. What he said was the brief market plunge. He was talking about an event on March, uh, May the 6th of last year. The brief market plunge was just an example of how complex and chaotic in a formal sense, he didn't mean in just a sort of common language, in a formal sense, these systems have become. What happened in the stock market is just a little example of how things can cascade or how technology can interact with market panic. So in other words, he's saying this system is vulnerable to this sort of phenomenon, a phenomenon which we don't have in our um, models. So just as a remark, 
What sort of systems could we build which do have this sort of potential for what are called by physicists phase transitions? Well, here, as I said, we spent the 20th century perfecting a model based on 19th century physics. Maybe in the 20th, 21st century, we could make a little bit more use of 20th century physics. Now, self-organization is an underlying theme here. In other words, these systems don't just um, evolve without anything going on inside them. There's a self-organizing property. And indeed, Hayek was a person who argued that the self-organizing properties of markets were very important. But he used this as a justification for not interfering with markets. And markets do clearly self-organize. But we have absolutely no reason to believe that this is a stable process. There's no, nobody has proved that when markets self-organize, this results in a stable outcome. And that's the point, that uh, they may self-organize, but why will we believe that this leads to some sort of optimality or some, something desirable? And what will happen frequently within these models is as rules emerge and develop and conventions develop, people will learn how to use those rules to their advantage. And that again will change the system. And we have this constant positive feedback which means that the system may undergo major changes. And I say all the economists here, at least, are aware of the difficulties uh, underlying our standard model, for, which is underlying the modern macroeconomics. But somehow we've separated that from financial economics. We somehow argue that financial markets and financial economics is separate from real economics. And I would argue that financial economics which seems to be very sophisticated, is based on equally shaky foundations. So here's a, uh, what I want to talk about briefly. Models of financial markets basically share the same building blocks. In these models, agents forecast the prices of the assets they're interested in. Once they've made those, forecasting, uh, those forecasts, then they will, that determines how much they will want to buy or sell of those assets. And that, of course, in turn, will determine the price of those assets. But once those prices have been determined, that in turn will change their forecasts of what's going to happen next. And it's that positive feedback that is so important. And so the prices feed back into the forecast, the forecast change the prices, and so forth. And the question is, once again, why will that, in fact, turn out to give a satisfactory result? Now, the efficient markets hypothesis says something very simple. It says that all the information available in the economy gets into the prices. So all people have to look at are the prices of assets. There's, you don't have to look at anything else. That, of course, immediately should seem to be paradoxical to you. Because if nobody is looking at the information, how does the information ever get into the prices? And that, of course, was the paradox of Grossman and Stiglitz. But the basic argument comes from Bachelier, who wrote his thesis in 1900. And he basically had the following idea. People get information, it arrives, uh, these signals arrive, they're a little stochastic, a little bit of stochastic noise which makes you change your behavior. And if you have lots of these little stochastic signals that arrive independently, when you aggregate them up, you're gonna get basically a normal process. These are gonna be distributed normal, normally, these, uh, these uh, changes. And therefore, it was argued, the price of stocks would, that the changes in the price of stocks would have a normal distribution. And that is what has been has under, uh, underlain all modern financial theory. But what happened? Poincaré, the famous French mathematician, who was the reporter uh, for um, uh, Bachelier's thesis, what did he say? He said, you know, when people are close together, they don't look at their information independently and then act on it. They are influenced by the guys around them. They get knocked right and left by what other people are doing. And so they have a tendency, he said, to behave like sheep. He talks about um, uh, Panurge's sheep. You remember the sheep that ran over the cliff and all the other sheep followed him. And he said, that's an intrinsic feature of human behavior, and that's something which we cannot eliminate. So already, Poincaré, 1900, said, don't accept this idea that all these little inf in independent pieces of information are getting into people's hands, they're acting on it, and all this appears in prices, and therefore the markets are efficient. In fact, many other people have argued against that. Keynes himself, Mandelbrot, spent his life arguing against the efficient markets hypothesis. And yet, it is the underlying 
hypothesis for Markowitz's optimal uh, portfolio theory and for Black-Scholes, which is still used as optional pricing. And so this uh, process built up on the basis of Bachelier's thesis. And everybody says how sad that poor Bachelier didn't, leave, uh, didn't live to see this great use of his own work but he also didn't live to hear Alan Greenspan in front of the House of Representatives Committee say the whole intellectual edifice collapsed in the summer of last year. Now many of our economist colleagues would not agree with that, but I think there's a lot of truth in it. And the efficient markets hypothesis, I think, as Krugman once pointed out, citing Mencken, there's always an easy solution to every human problem, neat, plausible, and wrong. So why did we persist? Why did we go on with a theory, as we did in general equilibrium too, with a theory which seems simply to be denied by the facts? Well, the argument is that if you have this Gaussian or normal hypothesis, then you can do the analysis. You can work out what the option prices should be and so forth. And so, like the lady who dropped her keys somewhere and was found looking under the street light and said, oh, did you drop your keys here? No, I dropped them over there, but I can't see over there. I can see much better here. So, same thing, you continue to look where there's light and not necessarily where you can find a solution. And Eugene Farmer himself, who was, um, is considered as one of the founders of, uh, fathers of efficient market, the efficient markets hypothesis, said that actually the efficient markets hypothesis is used for the notion that the more people diversify, the more possibilities they have, the better off they will be, the less risk they will have, and the more stable the system will be. He wrote a paper himself in 65 in a moment of weakness to show that once you drop this underlying assumption of normality, this may no longer be true. And of course, what people don't know is that Eugene Farmer was Mandelbrot's um, student, PhD student. And Mandelbrot once said, what a pity that my best student decided to make money rather than to do science. But um, why did we go on? Well, I think, again, like many professions, there's an enormous amount of inertia in a profession, and that's what's essentially thought of as people's human capital. They've invested a lot in knowing how to do those things, and they're not going to drop doing those things just because events seem to be inconsistent with what they're doing. And so now, think of the efficient markets hypothesis. Think of the portrayal in standard theory of how these markets work. You have individuals who are isolated, they're sitting in their corner, they receive a piece of information, they act upon it, and they're all very calm and calculating, like these typical individuals in a, uh, on a market floor. You can see they're calm, calculating, intertemporally optimizing individuals. And so where does the efficient markets hypothesis actually go wrong? Well, if you remember Poincaré's warning, it's the fact that people look at what other people are doing. And, of course, well, here, I don't want to spend a, a lot of time on this. One of the problems is that the way people are forecasting is influenced by the way other people are forecasting. And there's a very nice paper in Nature recently uh, which shows that if people don't know what other people are forecasting about a given process, if you take the average of their forecasts, it does rather well. But it takes a long time for it to settle down to something consistent. If you let people know what other people are forecasting, their opinions converge much more rapidly, but to a much worse forecast. So once people start to follow each other, they rapidly converge to a common opinion, but that opinion may not be the right one. So, once again, I don't want to bore this audience with this, but even from an econometrician's point of view, this notion that people will correctly anticipate the future and that you can therefore optimize in this world is simply incorrect if the world is not a world which is simply carrying on generating the movements in the same extended way. If you have these interferences, these breaks in the way things are happening, then it's not even logical to have rational expectations. Let me illustrate this whole story. These people are standing in Times Square. And this was an experiment, a famous experiment. And what they did was they looked up at the sky. After a while, there were a thousand people looking up at the sky. Because if the first people were looking at the sky, there must be something to look at, right? Therefore, people here inferred some information from what the other people were doing, and they all looked up at the sky. But there was nothing to be seen. They simply got it wrong. And I want to 
uh, illustrate this with a very simple example. And these are what are called, uh, called informational cascades. And the simplest example is what's called the restaurant example, and due to Banerjee, Banerjee's restaurant. The Banerjee's, re Banerjee's restaurant is not an Indian restaurant. Banerjee is a professor at MIT. But the idea is the following, that people have to choose between two restaurants. And they have two possible signals. They have their Michelin guide from five years ago, and then they have the advice of their friends. So this public signal, the Michelin guide, is not very reliable because it's, you know, it's uh, several years old. So it's only 55% reliable. Whereas the public signal, uh, whereas the private signal is 90% reliable. These are friends who went there recently. You know? Now the question is, let's suppose we have 100 people who want to go to this restaurant, and let's suppose that, as the French would say, restaurant A is objectively better. But the public signal, unfortunately, it's not very reliable, it says B is better. But 90% of the private signals that these people have get it right. They say A is better, restaurant A is better. So if all these people held up their signals, everybody would go to restaurant A. But it's possible everybody could wind up in B. Not because they're irrational, but because they're reasoning correctly, but because they're looking at other people. How can that possibly happen? Well, think of the first person who turns up, and he's looking to decide which restaurant to go to. Public signal says go into B. But his private signal says also go into B. He's one of the guys who got the wrong signal. So he says, ah, oh, B, B, OK, into B. The second guy, who's one of the guys who got the right signal, that A was better, turns up. And he's just going into restaurant A because his private signal is much more important than his public signal. And suddenly he says, ah, but there's somebody sitting in B. How can he possibly be sitting in B? He must have got the private signal that B was better. Now, his private signal is just as good as my private signal. So those two things cancel out. All I can look at is the public signal. B is better. So now he goes into restaurant B. You now have two people in restaurant B. And the third person turns up who got the right signal, A is better. He looks at his signals, a private signal, A, I, and then he looks up, ah, there are two people sitting in B already. How could that possibly have happened? And so forth. And you can see what will happen. Everybody will wind up in B. Now, what happened there? What went wrong? What went wrong is that all these people threw away their private information in a sense. They didn't use it to make their choice. Therefore, it never became public information. So people did not do what they're supposed to do in this theory, which is when they get their information, make, take some action which will reveal that information to the others. All the successive people threw away their information. And that can easily happen on markets. So people, instead of following the information they have, will take the common information and act upon it. And here is a little illustration. So, of course, as I said, collective influence therefore eliminates the private information. And here is a little illustration of such an informational cascade. You see these people here. Well, up at the top you've got a person who says, I've got a stock here that could really excel. Really excel. Excel. Sell. Sell. And they all go mad and they all say, sell, sell, sell. Down the bottom here, there's this person who says, this is madness, I can't take this anymore, goodbye. Goodbye, bye, bye. And now they all say bye, you see. And down here you've got this person who says, I've got a stock here, and so forth, and on it goes. And this illustrates that a tiny piece of information can get into the market, and instead of looking at the real information, people are just following what other people are doing. So, what's the problem with the efficient markets hypothesis empirically? Well, what we have to explain is that we have these sudden large movements in financial markets and we have to put this down to the arrival of something from the outside. But often you can see that there's a big movement and there's no particular exogenous shock at that moment. Here's an example. This is the German DAX stock exchange just before the dot-com bubble crash. And you can see that you could think of that as being consistent with Bachelier with a modern modification. That is, it's a random walk about a trend, okay? That looks okay. Unfortunately, that happened. So now what you've got to do is look at the top and say, how could such a huge change, such a sudden radical change in the tendency occur? Well, one way to do it is to say, let's come up with a more complicated stochastic process. And we'll put it down to some sort of or we could say we put it down some sort of exogenous shock. But the only exogenous shock there was that Boris Yeltsin either became or ceased to be president of Russia at the time, 
And that doesn't seem to be something which should have moved all markets in the world so much. Or the alternative, and one which I would favour, is to find a micro model of interacting agents which generates this sort of shift endogenously. And I want to illustrate this with the behaviour of an other sort of insect, ants. Now ants, again, are extremely simple animals. Okay? They learn in an environment where they have very limited and local knowledge, but they produce quite sophisticated aggregate behaviour. And here the illustration is, if you look at this, what the... Um, oh, can you see that? You may, can you see that there's a sort of... That there's a source of food and the ants come out of their nest and there are two paths to that source of food. And the question is, which one will they follow because each path is exactly the same as the other. There's no reason to favour one or the other. And you might say, well, the ants will sort of split evenly between the two. That's not the case. The ants will, in fact, divide themselves, not divide themselves between the two, but they will all concentrate on one path. And then after a while, they will all switch to the other path. And this is going to provide a little lesson, I think, for how people are behaving in markets, too. And with a bit of luck, we can run a little simulation on that. Pretty slow, I'm sorry about that. But um, I think you can see what's going on. And if we let that run, for some reason or other, in Helsinki, my computer runs slower than it did elsewhere. But anyway, I think what you can see, you can see what happened there. They all concentrated on one path, and they didn't split between the two. If you let this run long enough, they will switch to the other path from time to time. So they will switch back and forth, but they will not split themselves evenly between the two. So here are some ants. How do ants do this? They recruit other ants. In some species, they lay a trail of pheromone. In others, they meet each other and they touch each other's feelers, and then they recruit to food in that way. But the point is, ants who have found food recruit other ants, and this self-reinforces. I think you may just be able to see these two people. There are. See? Comes along, and he meets somebody, tells him, and on they go, right? And so, now the question is, if we now change this experiment a little bit, remember that what we're told is that these things have evolved in an optimal way. Let's look and see what happens if we now have two different paths, one of which is longer than the other. Now you might hope that the ants will now find the shortest path. And indeed, in this simulation, when we run it, yeah, there, you'll see after a while, these little guys, they will, some of them will go down the long path, but after a while they all settle on the short path, and that seems to be very nice. And so we say, oh, well, ants found a way to organize themselves efficiently. But Unfortunately, if you run that thing long enough, every now and then they all go down the long path. Not very often, but they do go down the long path. And people say, well, these are just simulations. You're just telling us stories here. So you need to look at some real ants, okay? And here you will see some real ants. And after a while, you see what I was mentioning before, they're not optimal. That guy in the middle there is completely lost. But, <laughs> Um, anyway, after a while, they will all go down the short path. So everyone is very happy and say, well, ants are pretty efficient, right? And we, if only we were like ants, we would do well. Let me now tell you the truth about that film. That film was made by Guy Terrelas for German television. And German television had a program about optimal adaptation and evolution. And so he ran this experiment for them. And unfortunately, the ants all went down the long path. So the German television said, we can't have that. That's not, it doesn't consistent with our program. So Guy ran the, pro, ran the experiment again. And they all went down the long path again. And so the Germans got very upset and took their cameras and were about to leave. And then Guy, a third time, ran his experiment. This time, they chose a short path and they filmed that. And you will see in their television program that that's what you observe. That one time, they went down a short path. But often, they go down the long path. And they switch between the two. So the idea that these th in nature everything sort of somehow optimally organizes and gets sorted out is simply inconsistent with what you observe. So those are just my acknowledgments. So we, I don't have time to tell you about how this process works, but you might be interested to say, well, what is that going to do with financial markets, which you told us about? Well, in exactly the same way, 
as the ants are recruiting other ants to food, you could think of people as using different rules to forecast. And when they use those rules, what they do is they will recruit other people to, to their rule if it's successful. So somebody who is using a rule which turns out to be successful in forecasting will tend to have more and more people who follow that rule. And these rules are self-reinforcing. And eventually, these rules wind up with everybody following one rule for a while. But every now and then, there will be a little stochastic movement. Somebody will fall off and start to use another rule. And the whole system will switch over to using another rule. And that's what can cause a lot of problems in, in Marx. So with Hans Fulner and Ulrich Horst, two German mathematicians, we made a model of that. And I don't have time to explain to you uh, all about that model. But the point is that we had two sorts of people, chartists and fundamentalists, who are often characterized as being the two types of behavior you observe in the financial markets. Chartists only regard, uh, look at previous prices. They're not worried about the fundamentals in the market. Fundamentalists believe that there are fundamental equilibrium values for certain things. And that, that is what the stock prices, asset prices should depend on. When you get all the people being chartists, the system has a tendency to explode. When you get people being uh, fundamentalists, it tends to return to the <coughs> equilibrium values that they believe in. And the, in, within this simple model that we built, all you have to do is you don't have to prevent the chartists having forecasts which explode. All you have to do is have a bound on the probability that people will become chartists. If there's a restriction on the probability that people will become chartists, then what will happen is that for a while everybody essentially will be a chartist, and then eventually everybody will switch over to becoming fundamentalists. And so you get these movements where the, period, the market is pretty calm, and then suddenly you get a lot of volatility when the chartists take over. So you don't want to know about the ergodicity. The point about this sort of model is that it's in contrast with the standard models because standard models want things to converge to the equilibrium prices. In this model they never converge to an equilibrium price. They have movement all the time but this movement has a certain structure. You can actually predict the probability that the price will be in a certain range but you cannot predict when it will change or what it will be at any particular moment. And I think that's a more interesting notion of how markets work than to think of markets as always converging to some equilibrium price and then suddenly getting knocked off it. So here is the distribution of stock prices. And first of all, we ran this model where there were no chartists around to interfere. And you get a nice normal distribution of the movements of stock prices. When you add the chartists, the distribution becomes much fatter. You start to get rather, under the standard assumptions, rather unlikely events happening very often. You've all heard about a book called The Black Swan, right? Well, this is the same phenomenon, that these unlikely events, or seem to be unlikely under standard assumptions, actually happen with much greater frequency. And, of course, the bubbles that occur coincide with periods where there are a lot of chartists. Okay, now, up to this point, I have... What's going to be? Two minutes. Right. <clears throat> this is going to be very tough. Okay, up to this point, I have talked about the people interacting between each other. Well, what I haven't talked about, and banks and so forth, what I haven't talked about is the fact that the way in which they interact, the structure of their interaction, may be very important. And in particular, the way in which they're linked will have an impact on the things that happen in the system. And the usual argument in financial markets is that increased connectivity in the graph that links people will lead to greater stability because risk gets more diversified and so forth. But in fact, that is untrue. It is not true that just because a network becomes more connected, that it is uh, likely to be more stable. Okay, so let me just point out a nice comparison made by Andy Haldane, who is the director of the Bank of England responsible for financial stability. And what he essentially says is that the, he was comparing the outbreak of uh, bird flu with the collapse of Lehman Brothers. And what he's essentially saying is that these are the same sort of phenomena. It's a collapse of a network of highly interacting, highly interrelated individuals. And he says, to, if you look at the end, seizures in the electricity grid, degradation of ecosystems, spread of economics, and the disintegration of the financial system, each is essentially a different branch of the same network family tree. 
and we have to pay attention to the structure of the network. Here is a little example of how this sort of thing goes on. I hope this is going to work. With my friends, we did try to make this run. Oh, what happened there? Let's try again. Well, this could speed my talk up a lot, basically. Because what happened to our amazing... We have this beautiful film here in which what you see is banks going bankrupt and they spread across the United States. And you can see the contagion. You can see certain regions, many banks go. And if you look at the underlying region, re uh, reasons for that, it's the connections between these banks that are important. And what you see is these banks, the failure of banks spreading across the United States in a beautiful way. And I'm very sad that I can't make you see that. But also you will be happy because that'll speed me up a lot. So on we go. And here I just want to mention rapidly the evolution of the global financial network. The nodes here are countries. The size of the nodes is the amount of foreign assets held by those countries. And the thickness of a link is the importance of the assets held by the two countries in question. If it's Japan and the US, it's how many Japanese assets the US was holding added to the opposite, the um, number of US assets held by the Japanese. Now you see there that this network started to develop in 1995, it's much more connected than it was. So in principle, it should be much more stable. But you begin to see big nodes forming and thicker links. And by 2005, you see there are some huge nodes, countries holding huge amounts of foreign assets, and there are some very thick links between some countries. And everybody said, well, still, it's much more connected than it was. Therefore, it was much more stable. But in fact, what we observe is that for various uh, symptoms of the problem show up. In the, in the nature of the uh, nodes, which are very big, so here what you have is a sort of distribution of the size of the nodes, if you like. And as that distribution becomes more and more skewed, this situation becomes less and less stable. So looking at the network of interactions can give you a good idea as to whether a system is stable or not. So the result is that the system was very vulnerable and indeed did collapse. And uh, this is just a remark which I won't make. Um, why is Greece of concern to the US? Not because the US is heavily invested in Greece, but because many European banks in which the US is heavily invested hold assets in Greece or are invested in Greek banks. And so this connectivity of the network can lead to it being much more vulnerable than it would have been without. Here was a whole thing about derivatives, which I can't talk about, but this was just a Warren Buffett in 2002 already said, this idea that we can just diversify more and more risk and this would be a good for the system. He said, they are in my view, financial weapons of mass destruction. And that was in 2002. And he turned out, of course, to be right. So, don't have time to show you this little model. I'll come to my conclusions. That was a little model which showed you what happened in these markets and why these mortgage-backed assets uh, collapsed. And it was simply because people who held them didn't check on them. They were sold on to other people. Everybody would sell them on. Provided you thought that your counterparty was not going to check, you had no, object, uh, no reason to check yourself. It was more and more complicated with these complicated instruments to check the value of the underlying assets. So you just gave up checking and sold them on. And when some people started to check, the whole system unraveled. Because um, what happened was that then everybody started to check, and these assets were then very evident. OK, so I don't think it's easy to regulate such a system. We can't stabilize it. Don't have time to talk about that. I had a nice thing for you there, but I'm not allowed to do that. So in a world where individuals interact with each other locally and with limited information, the collected behavior system may undergo sudden and large changes without any exogenous shock. Asset markets, particularly derivative markets, are vulnerable to these, and they are not the results of individual irrational, uh, irrationality, but of the intrinsic fragility of such systems. How long will it take before this uh, sort of view starts to become more predominant? Well, Max Planck had a very pessimistic view. As he said, a new scientific truth does not triumph by convincing its opponents and making them see the light, 
but rather because its opponents eventually die. And a new generation grows up that is familiar with it. And I'm happy to see that there's some young people here. <laughs> However, I don't want people to take it that this should mean that you stop thinking analytically about the economy. What I do think is that we should not be wedded to or locked into using certain types of tools and not look at other approaches. And Vernon Smith once said, I advise all my students to read widely in science and other disciplines and very narrowly in economics. And as Buzz Brock said, you want to keep an open mind, but you don't want to open it so far that your brain falls out. And if anybody was interested in knowing a little bit more about this sort of idea, this book came out uh, last year. And uh, that person, by the way, is not me. That's Joseph Schumpeter, because he's with the Schumpeter Lich. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, it's been I went on too long. Thank you, Alan. This was absolutely beautiful. Uh, we are a bit over time already, but we might just use a few minutes uh, for a couple of very, very quick questions, comments. Uh, I find the presentation fascinating, but I noticed that there was a, a missing ingredient in all of this. When you were talking about ants, you were invoking empirical evidence. But when you were talking about economic theory, the data were never there. Of course, some of us have tested the efficient mind hypothesis 20 years ago with thousands of different data sets and rejected it unceremoniously. And we said the data do not have these structures that these theories are imposing on them. So if we really want to make progress, the one constant here that can guide us to better theories is actually analyzing the data better and learning from the data itself. So I totally agree with what you said, that we have to bring in the one part of reality that we have access to and we, are, we can assess and distinguish between promising theories and totally irrelevant. I've done the same thing with these DSG models. Total nonsense. The data have nothing to do with this. So we have to start from somewhere and convince people to abandon models that have, bear no resemblance to what the data that we collect and we want to understand say. But I'm 100% agreement with you, and I think the real question, the sort of fundamental question is why is it that we are so reluctant to, instead of taking our models and then trying to fit the data to them or calibrate them because of they won't work economically. Why is it that we insist on doing that? And I think that in part, it's due to the way we're educated as economists. Right from the start, people do not say to your, stu to your students, I tried to do this in our university. In my micro course, I said to students, everybody here has to go out and collect a data set. A data set which he himself has assembled, right? not a data set somebody else gave him. And people said to me, you can't waste their time with that, you know. They're not going to learn enough mathematics. They won't know how to solve these problems. If you start to make them look at data, you know, and collecting data, I mean, it's not even clean, proper data. But I think exactly, if people were brought up like that, as they are in other sciences, you know, you have to get your hands dirty. You have to look at the data and see what the data says and not try and build your structural model and then look and see whether the data fits it. So I, really, I think it's built into our system that we don't encourage our students enough to simply take, the, get the messages from the data. Right? And I, I think we're exactly in agreement. It's, it's unfortunate when the first question is. <laughs> is so, so that was our response. So we have now one draws. Try to keep it even short, please. All right. Okay. Uh, so on cascades, I mean, you mentioned the old vanity paper, which was, of course, a, a piece of theory. The, the vanity paper was, was but, but there's been quite a run of experiments with cascades since then. And you know, each experiment varying a new parameter in the usual to fiddling around. And, and, but I think they've been enough now that it's starting to settle into a general result, or at least some general robust patterns. And in fact, it's interestingly bee looking, very much like your bee story. That is, the experiments are pretty strongly suggesting that when the market is very noisy, you get more contrarian behavior than would be rational for the individual.
but in consequence, it's, bit, it's better for the market because less information is thrown away than would be if all the individuals ignored their private information as they rationally should. As you turn up, as you turn the noise down in these experiments, that uh, you, you wind up with too much contrary behavior. Mm -hmm. So that is, that is, it's inefficient for the market, but less, less contrary behavior than you have when the noise parameters are high. So in that respect, at least, the, it's not, the, it's a bit misleading to suggest that the cascade work is showing that, is, is predicting a more market volatility than we might expect. But it's puzzling, right, why people, it's not good for, for, for the rational expectations hypothesis that people act more contrarian than they ought to from their own point of view. On the other hand, it looks like there's a kind of meta-stabilizing behavior. Yeah, actually, um, I, I, are you talking about experiments or observations? Experiments. Of, I'm talking yes, about feed, both lab and field experiments. Right, because um, there are some of these lab experiments, um, which I think Mariman and other people have done, uh, in which you get these bubbles occurring. And there, it's... Um, it's not obvious that these people are being, at least from what I've seen, being contrarian. Um, uh, even when the asset has an absolutely fixed term, when we know what it's worth, somehow people start to overbid for it in the middle of the experiment. And uh, it's, it's not obvious to me that the result that comes out of that is that you're getting contrarians there. Now, where are you, how are you introducing the noise in your system? So the, so the noise is just a, a, a parameter on the, on the distribution, uh, on the relationship between the proportion of data that are accurate and the variance around that accuracy mean. So it's, but the, 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 it's not that you always have lots of people who are hurting, right? It's, not, it's just a question of what proportion at the aggregate level of contrarian behavior you get. Right. right? So, so the point is merely that you get more contrarian behavior than a rational group of people, perfectly rational agents should show as the variance in the data goes up. Yeah, so I mean this is uh, a little bit like uh, the example with ants. You have uh, more ants that get lost when they're going to the food than you might expect would be optimal in some sense. But, so they're in some sense contrarians because they're going off anywhere. But the argument there is that they stabilize the system because in the end the food runs out, you know, and so these guys may find food. But so you're arguing that, as I understand it, that the sort of stylized fact now is that you're getting people who seem to be acting against their own interests, but in so doing, they lead to a collective outcome which is more satisfactory. Right. And that, that's very interesting. It's unfortunate we need to stop here. Yeah, we are short of time. It's all my fault. I, I didn't think close enough uh, physically nor on our speaker. Nevertheless, uh, let's thank him again. Thank you.